clean. <laughs> um, today we're going to talk about creating accessible content in Drupal and really thinking about it from the content uh, perspective, from the, the, the perspective of content publishers and what their responsibility is in accessibility. Uh, so to introduce myself, my name is Suzanne Dergacheva. I'm co-founder of Evolving Web. We're an agency uh, based in Montreal. We do a lot of work in government and higher education. Um, and oh, and I'm also the lead of the Promote Drupal initiative. So if by chance you have any interest in helping market Drupal um, or write content about how awesome Drupal is, uh, please reach out to me. I would love to chat with you about that as well. Um, I, in the past, have done a lot of trainings um, and worked with organizations at the level of like content publishers are onboarding onto Drupal, they want to know what it does. And so a lot of my ideas today are coming from that perspective of um, uh, working with people who are pretty new to Drupal and, and using it as a platform for communications and publishing. So I'm wondering who here in the room is a content person, like you're responsible for content management at your organization. Yeah. And are there are developers in the room. Yeah, awesome. Um, and others, maybe like PMs, designers, yeah. People lifting up their hand for everything, like, yeah, I do everything. <laughs> I'm the Drupal person. Mm. So a lot of the things I want to talk to you today is like workflows that you would create for a content publishing team. So if you are a content publisher, you might be involved with this as a user. But if you're a developer, you might be actually building the workflow. So I think it's great to have different perspectives in the room, and hopefully there'll be a little something for everybody. And at the end, I would also love to hear if you have other um, ways that you're doing things or um, experiences that you want to share. So if we make it interactive, too, and, and you want to talk a little bit about how you work, I think that would be really uh, fun, too. So I know a lot of people um, are now quite well versed in accessibility. So I don't want to go into a whole thing about like, here's why you should care. Um, I think a lot of people have heard that spiel many times and you're already on board. Um, but I like to kind of orient the conversation a little bit. So I will just run through it a little bit quickly. Um, when we're thinking about building accessible content, it is really nice to uh, think about the why and remember kind of who we're designing for and what use cases we're designing for. Um, so knowing a little bit about the kind of categories of disability that we tend to design for, um, it, it's a good thing. I think we often think about the visual. That's the first thing that comes to mind. We think about, okay, if you can't see this website, how am I gonna consume the content? Uh, but it's also good to keep in mind that Sometimes we create content with the assumption that people can hear, like audio and visual content. Uh, videos are more and more, um, more and more popular, so of course those include audio. Um, motor is, on, is another one, so even though somebody might be able to interact and see a page on your website, they might use some other kind of technology, like a keyboard, to um, tap through it or interact with it. Um, and then there's cognitive and intellectual disabilities, which are also important for content editors to keep in mind. So if we're trying to create content that's ex as accessible to as wide an audience as possible, we want to make sure that we're taking that into perspective when we think about the reading level we're designing for, or the way that content is broken down um, into a way that is not going to require a uh, you know, university level of uh, literacy to consume. When we think about designing for accessibility, there's also these four principles. Uh, we want the content to be perceivable. So that means it's just available. It's available through the different, the different senses that we have. Um, we want it to be operable. So when we think about not just like consuming the content, but actually interacting with it. And interaction can be as simple as interacting with a menu. Um, or interacting with a link on a page. 
that needs to be something that you can do with your keyboard uh, and other input methods. Uh, so basically, you're not relying on a mouse to interact with content. You want content to be understandable, and uh, this is really key to content uh, editors, to actually writing the content for the pages we're building. Uh, so not just that you can read content, but also that things like labels are really easy to understand. And then um, robust is more just about having a product, meaning like usually we think about a website, but could also be an app um, or whatever else we're building. Uh, we want it to be available to assistive technology. So this is where we think about testing with uh, screen readers, testing with uh, keyboards, uh, when we read assistive technology, people tend to jump right to screen reader, but uh, keyboard is really one of the most common assistive technologies. So uh, testing with that and making sure that everything is still working and doesn't just fall apart once we're using a different um, method. The benefits of accessibility are many beyond just making your website available to as wide an audience as possible and having uh, compliance with the law, which is like, okay, we have to do this. So uh, there are so many other benefits. So we find that accessible websites are just, uh, have better SEO. So they're just, the, the words on the page just better capture the, the meaning. Um, they tend to have a better content structure, uh, and this is all good for, for SEO, uh, especially things like heading text and link text selection that just drives straight into your SEO value. So you get a lot of other gains beyond the accessibility itself. You also tend to improve the usability for mobile users. Um, you improve usability for people. This goes along with making it available to as wide an audience as possible. Low network speeds. So this is something we don't always think about because we're trying to create websites that appeal to people in cities who uh, have great internet, like our colleagues who are at their workplaces and they've got a fast connection. Um, but in fact, if we're, especially in government, if we're designing for everybody, we want to think about the smaller population size groups that are like up north or in more rural areas where these, uh, there's low, low network speeds. Um, and so when you design something that's accessible, if you uh, immediately get the meaning of an entire page just through the text, even if your network speed is low and you're not able to load videos or images, you're still getting the value of the content. So that's why we have this benefit to these users. Um, and then situational disabilities. This is the one I think I think a lot of us uh, know about now, but um, just because you know somebody doesn't have a long-term disability, they might have a situation where they have carpal tunnel syndrome, they've broken their wrist, um, maybe they are um, you know, feeding their baby while they're working, which is something I can now relate to. I only have one hand, okay. It's not my right hand, so I'm going to navigate with a keyboard. Um, and suddenly, I'm in a situation where I'm really benefiting from um, accessibility tools and the ability to use assistive technologies. So the, the benefit is, goes way beyond um, just what we think of traditionally as disability. Um, so what I want to run through today is accessibility in the, con in the context of the content life cycle. So now I want to shift to thinking about um, how content gets published in an organization. I think sometimes as Drupal developers, I, you know, the developers who raise their hands, we like to think, oh yeah, when somebody creates content, they open Drupal, they, you know, they log in, and they think, what shall I write about today? And then they open up their WYSIWYG editor, or they're creating a page that's based with all these, created with all these paragraphs, or layout builder, whatever the tool is, and then they author their content there. And then they hit publish, and like that's the life cycle right there. It's their content. Obviously, that's not not the the reality. How many people here are using something like Word to publish content or to, to originally write the draft of content? Who here uses like Google Google Docs, something like this, something collaborative? 
Maybe you have things where you're doing a lot of commenting or versioning of content before it gets to the stage of, oh, now I'm in Drupal and I'm filling in a form. Um, similarly, after content gets published on a Drupal website, maybe nobody looked at that piece of content. Who here has published a piece of content and you got like five views of, of it? Yeah, so then we decide a month later, oh, well, let's push this out onto LinkedIn or like let's rewrite the content so that it's better because we have this new version and we think we can get more traction on it now. So often the content life cycle is much longer than just a single filling in the form in, in Drupal kind of thing. And, uh, and thinking about accessibility both before and after we're in the Drupal forum is going to be beneficial. So who's responsible for accessibility? I think a lot of people now um, are on board with this idea that it's not just a, one accessibility expert per organization who can take responsibility. It's a much bigger, um, bigger responsibility than that. It's something that has to be really shared amongst team members. So um, I think this, inc this group includes communicators, marketers, content editors. A lot of times the decisions that you're making in terms of your content have this effect on accessibility. And it's really hard to give only designers or only developers responsibility because in the long term other people are going to be making decisions independently. You're not going to have a designer or developer check every piece of content going out the door. And uh, I think some people might answer this question, who is responsible for accessibility? Oh, well, I have Site Improve. They're responsible for accessibility. Oh, I have uh, some other tool. Dubbot, that's what we often use these days. Is anyone using these tools, Site Improve, Dubbot? Does anyone use another one? Some kind of accessibility uh, scanner. Accessibility. So what did you say? Accent tools is common. Yeah. That's right, there's lots of tools that we can use. Um, and it's nice to think like, oh, we checked that checkbox. But when we look deeper at those tools, we see that often they're giving responsibilities back to us. They're telling us, oh, well, I found these two errors on the page, but then there's 10 other things that you have to check manually. And that manual work often um, does uh, come down to you know the content editor or the person picking the image for the page that has to have some awareness of what the best choice is for accessibility. Um, and then managers have to make all these people talk to each other. <laughs> so they kind of have to know the value as well to give people time. Um, one thing that's maybe um, not just immediately captured by this um, is that content governance often plays a role. So who here has a kind of content governance framework that they're using? Does anyone have like, here's all the types of content we have, and here's who's responsible for, for uh, giving input into those, that content. And sometimes there's somebody just responsible for making sure it's, it, the SEO values there, making sure it's accessible, making sure that it's factually accurate. But sometimes the content governance is quite built up and there's somebody who plays the role of accessibility expert in the content. But often, actually, that just gets assigned to uh, content editors. So we have to empower, empower content editors throughout the life cycle. So I'm going to talk through these. I made up these seven steps, so this isn't some magic thing. I think that these often play, a, uh, often are involved in the content life cycle. You might have a totally different process or other steps that I'm missing here. Um, so I think you can kind of think about how accessibility works in your own version of this. But hopefully, the the uh, ideas I'll share about each one will help uh, with whatever process you're using. Okay, the first one is the content brief. Uh, who here uses content briefs in their organization? Okay, you can skip this one. You don't have to worry about it. <laughs> um, so maybe you don't have a content brief, but maybe you hire a writer. Uh, or maybe you are working with a subject matter expert and you have to tell them oh yeah, you're going to write the article about this, or it's your responsibility to publish 
to give me some content for this landing page. So it might not be as formal as a content brief, but at some point, um, somebody is getting the idea that they need to write content for a certain page, right? Um, and so when, they, they're, um, when they're doing this initial writing, it's good for them to be aware of how some of their choices are gonna impact things later down the line. So something as simple as you know, the choice of title um, is, gonna, is going to, that the, the title of your content becomes the label for that content and uh, ends up having a great importance around in, in terms of accessibility. It's the biggest thing we see on the page, so visually, of course, it's something important, um, but for somebody who can't just skim the page or glance at it to see what it means, the title is much more important. And especially for landing pages, I find people often pick these kind of like nice marketing sounding titles that often don't actually describe what's on the page. So the choice of title is actually really important as a, as a label. Um, and sometimes that title then becomes like a, a link text when you're linking to the content. It becomes sometimes an alt text actually for an image. It often gets reused in these different ways. So we want to make sure that it's actually describing the content. Um, often the person who's the subject matter expert is going to be picking media that's going to be used. So they might decide, oh, the main image here on this page is going to be this big diagram. It's going to have tons of details because we really want it to be a really functional piece of content. Um, but overloading our images, of course, with text can make them harder to, to be accessible later down the line. Um, so even at this stage of like coming up with the idea, it's uh, for the content and starting the writing process, it's good if there's some um, basic accessibility uh, knowledge that goes into that. Okay, writing and approving content. So, um, when you're actually sitting down and, and writing the content, so maybe this isn't you, again, maybe it's a subject matter expert or uh, the content editor, uh, the decisions you're making, there's a few things that really directly lead to how uh, understandable the content is going to be. Um, so first of all, making sure that content is understandable. This is a bit of a vague one, like how do I make sure my content is understandable? Um, breaking up content into different sections can go a long way to doing that. Um, using lists, having well-structured content. The reading level is something I'll talk about in a second. Um, ha having a heading structure that's actually following the, um, like a hierarchy of heading two before heading three, for example, and then writing the link text. So I find that these are kind of the most important things that the actual writer needs to know about. Um, reading level. Has anyone ever checked the reading level of their... Sometimes it's shocking that you know, we, we write and we think like, oh, this is easy enough to understand. But simple word choices can really take our writing from one reading level to the next. So it's a good idea to test if you, you don't, you know, you might not have time to do this for every piece of content that you write or every piece of content that you publish. But just to try out a tool, um, this one's, you can go to app.readable.com to, to check it out. But it's just going to give you an idea of the uh, reading level for your content. And it's going to help you identify things like jargon that you're using. Um, it's going to help you see where maybe you have long sentences. You're not using plain text as much as you could. Um, it could help you just figure out, oh, I have paragraphs that are too long. I should be using lists. Um, and then it'll give you um, a, a reading level score. So you'll be able to see kind of where, where you are. And you probably want to be, I feel like, uh, yeah, you want to be less than a grade eight reading level for public websites. And public websites means like, you know, if you're a government agency, certainly you should be uh, less than that. Um, and even for people who, you know, can read at a higher level, 
I don't know that I want to use my full range of reading skills to read a government website. If I'm reading a New Yorker article and there's a, you know, a long sentence with some challenging vocabulary, that's awesome. But if I'm just trying to figure out how to get my driver's license renewed, I would like short sentences and like to the point, right? Um, heading structure. Headings should show the outline of the page. So there's been a lot of work shown that people um, using assistive technologies really rely on headings to scan the text of the page and to get to the part of the page that they want to go to. You know, we do this often when we're looking at a page. Um, and if you're using a screen reader, you want to be able to do the same thing. Um, so actually, this study um, of screen reader users is really interesting. Uh, if you go to webaim.org, uh, you can find some survey results. Kind of shows us like how do people using screen readers actually use uh, the web? How do they consume content? What challenges do they face? And one of the findings that's kind of the most interesting uh, that I found was that people use uh, headings to navigate within a page, uh, and they use those before they go to uh, you know, search on the page or using links or other things. 7% um, just read the whole page, so good on them. <laughs> They're reading all your content, but everyone else is trying to skim and just go straight to the point. So navigation uh, or heading, using headings to navigate is like really going to be key. Um, as we can see, links are also one way that people use to navigate through a page. And if you're uh, just, this is like a, for those of you who have never tried using a screen reader before, a screen reader gives some shortcuts for um, basically navigating through the page using different, uh, kind of different landmarks on the page. So you can call up a list of all the headings. You can also pull up a list of all the sections. You can pull up a list of all the links. And so if you want to see, well, what does this page link to? Um, you can go and look at the links menu. If you kind of know, well, this page should link to uh, a download of a PDF I was looking for, or it should link to this application form that I know I want to fill out, then you might just pull up this links menu. And as you can, can see, it would be very frustrating if all the links that you tried to go to just say, read more with no context. So this is a really common way of like trying to get to the next step in a process for someone using a screen reader. And this is why having a read more link is a big no-no for accessibility. Instead, we want our link text to be a bit more descriptive. And so uh, just uh, showing content editors this so that they're aware of the impact of link text writing, it, it, I think is a good idea. Just giving a little bit of education about what those links are used for in the context of a screen reader. Um, and it's really hard to write good link text. I think this is actually the hardest thing as a content writer myself, when I'm trying to tell people, oh, on this blog post we're about to publish, you know, we have to have a better link text. But actually writing that link text can be really hard. Um, it's, I don't think it's something that really can be done just by the publisher. If it it kind of has to be done by the writer, because it has to still flow well in, in a bit of text. Um, and the links really have to have meaning separated from the text, which is also hard. Uh, selecting images and media is another big thing when it comes to the whole workflow of creating content. So this is often something that comes shortly after you know, the text of the page is written. Might happen at the same time if you're assembling a landing page, you might be adding different components to the page and deciding on what the balance of text and images should be. Um, in general, we want to you know, consider what an image is meant to communicate. Some images are really just used to set the mood. They're not really there to be content. Other images have a lot of meaning behind them, like a diagram. Um, and so uh, that, that, plays, that, that, that kind of leads into what kind of alt text you're going to be writing for the images. 
Um, you also want to be avoiding images in general with text. Sometimes it's unavoidable because you're trying to communicate something quite complicated. But unless you have something like a diagram that you need to present, uh, if you just have a nice image, you shouldn't just have text in there for no, no good reason. You should have some other way to present the text on the page as actual text. Um, and then we want to think about the, 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 yeah, the meaning of images. So not just, like the fact that there's three robots here, like that's very nice. Um, but how does that actually tie back into the content? Is it the fact that the robots are considering what images and media to select? Uh, that's kind of more the meaning that I'm trying to present here in this slide. So that should play into the alt text. So the alt text, like, it's nice if it just describes, like, it's yellow and there's robots. But if that doesn't communicate the meaning of that that's connected to the content, it's not the most valuable thing to include. And sometimes we see alt texts with, you know, a whole paragraph that describes a lot of visual detail. Um, and that could be very frustrating for somebody who's just tr quickly trying to get to the point of, you know, why did you, why did you put this image here? Um, yeah, so image selection. Um, you can actually leave an alt text empty for decorative images. So that's something to to really think about, like if you just have some nice images there but they're not adding any content to the page, the alt text can remain like an empty string. Um, captions are there for complicated images and diagrams and that's key because uh, people who are using a screen reader, that doesn't encompass everybody who has vision impairment problems. There's a lot of people who, um, you know, they're not blind, they can see a page, but maybe they're using a magnifier to help them because they can't see as well. And for these types of users, you know, having an alt text isn't going to help. They're not going to see the alt text. They're actually looking at the page, but maybe they can't see that tiny text that you put in the diagram. Um, and maybe they can't see all the detail of the image, and they're going to really benefit from a caption which is going to be displayed. Okay, so then we get to Drupal. <laughs> this is where you might actually be um, adding the content to the website. And I know at this point it might be hand something that we hand off from one user to the other. A lot of you said, oh yeah, we're using Word, we're using you know, Google Docs to author our content. Um, and at some point that document is going to end up in the hands of somebody who's going to put it into the uh, Drupal form. Um, now, the first thing that we see here is that there is a WYSIWYG editor. Who here has ever, like, designed a WYSIWYG editor? Mm -hmm. Like, I'm going to put this button here, yeah, I'm going to, mm -hmm. okay. Now, the content editors are using the WYSIWYG editor, and the content looks terrible, and there's all these extra spaces. Who here feels the pain of this, this happening? Yeah, we have all this WYSIWYG content, and it's... Looks, t looks awful. And people keep adding different fonts and yeah, WYSIWYG editors are, are hard. Um, sometimes, you know, we really want to minimize the number of options we give to content editors, but if we limit it too much, then the existing content on a website will all break because they won't have the tools to actually edit the HTML that's already been created. Um, so often we're, our hands are a little bit tied because we have a lot of legacy content we have to support while trying to encourage new content to be super clean and um, not have too much, you know, styling or HTML that we don't want. Um, and WYSIWYG editors can also, you know, create a, a content structure that's not accessible because maybe we'll end up putting in headings in an order that doesn't make sense, or maybe we'll end up um, adding some, some tags that like make text bold in the wrong way. Um, so if, Wiz, WYSIWYG editors are full of problems for accessibility because they just complicate the content. So often from a, from a designer, from a developer perspective, I don't want to give them the editor. I just want there to be like fields on the page where they can fill in just the text and all the formatting is going to be handled, all the HTML is going to be handled on the theme side um, or in my front end. 
uh, platform. But nonetheless, we often have to work with WYSIWYG editors. Who here has a WYSIWYG editor on a website that they built or that they use? Yeah, like everybody. Of course, we're all still using, it's 2023, we're all still using WYSIWYG editors. So with WYSIWYG editors come this extra, you know, randomness of content that can be produced. And so there's a couple ways to deal with this because the people, you know, filling in this, this content they can be trained in accessibility. You can learn you know, what accessibility looks like. You can learn some best practices. But you can also um, go off and create really inaccessible things very easily. Um, so there's been some tools built to help with this. So after you fill in the WYSIWYG editor and you want to click publish and you're, you're trying to get to that next step, um, um, then you get to the point where you want to test the compliance. So I'm referencing a tool here called uh, Sally. Has anyone used this? So this is one uh, tool that you can use to check that your content is compliant. But actually, I'm going to tell you about some other tools as well. This is just a you know one slide, uh, one one option. Um, another one I want to really recommend, and I think that there is a there might have already been a session about this today, is uh, Editorially. Has anyone used that tool, Editorially? I have another talk tomorrow. Another talk tomorrow? Great. Yeah, so Editorial is a really nice tool because at the moment of publication, um, the content editor is going to see uh, er errors and warnings about the content on the page. And it's scoped, what I love about it is it's scoped within just the content part. So as a content editor, if I start to see error messages about, you know, the logo of this website might be inaccessible or the footer menu has a problem, um, I'm not going to know how to fix that. I just am interested in the problems that I just created by, you know, creating some uh, markup with the WYSIWYG editor that wasn't ideal. Or maybe I embedded a, a, a map iframe and there's a problem with, with that. Um, or maybe it's a problem with uh, the, the way that I did my headings or the, the type of image that I inserted. Um, so I want to know about the problems that I have the power to fix. And so something like editorially or, or this, this tool here, um, uh, can be really helpful. And the reason I would suggest editorially is because it's well maintained. There's a module for Drupal, um, and so it's something that has good momentum behind it. Um, so I would suggest starting with that if you aren't already using something else. And then there are um, modules for Site Improve and Dubbot, which are like the more of the paid services that I mentioned earlier. Um, and those are good for giving you an overview, but for example, the DubBot one, it doesn't give you the live feedback. So just because you're using that doesn't mean there's not a role for editorially to play. <laughs> okay, my colleague edited these slides yesterday and I think he added this as a joke. <laughs> so I'm like, no, what, what is this? There's not enough contrast. So yeah, clearly, um, just on the projector as on my laptop. It's impossible to see uh, this text. Simply not enough contrast on the page. Um, creating a style guide to make sure that that doesn't happen with your content uh, is, is really important. And hopefully this is a step where the content editor doesn't have anything to think about because all these considerations have already been handled at the level of your theme. Um, the more that you do to reduce the complexity of content that a content editor has to write and just have uh, fields that they can fill in, the more that you can handle on the Drupal side. Um, so this is the benefit of creating components, things like paragraph types or block types to build up the content of a page. It's really going to streamline how content is created, it's going to make sure that it's more structured, and you're going to have less issues with um, a style guide not being followed. And then. And then you just have to worry about the style guide itself being accessible. So hopefully a designer has already thought it through um, and made sure there's enough contrast between um, the, the text in the foreground and the, 
color in the background. Um, some people like to give some flexibility though because content editors say, hey, I have some ideas about how this page should look. Um, so who here has like components where you can pick a style? Like maybe you can pick a background color or, yeah, so watch for that. Um, it it's, tends to be better to give options of like a, a color palette for a component rather than just providing the content editor with a color picker, which is a recipe for not accessible, something being not accessible. Okay, a couple last points because I know we're running out of time. Um, PDFs, I know a lot of you are thinking, I heard that PDFs are not accessible and you should never use them, <laughs> which, yes, uh, I think PDFs are one of those things that are on the list of um, things that screen reader users dislike. I think I have the results right here. Uh, people are very likely that, it's very likely that PDFs are going to pose a challenge to someone consuming the content. Um, but nonetheless, we have PDFs. And so if, if we have to create them, let's make sure we're creating them in a way that is, is accessible. Um, and often, again, that doesn't start with publishing it on the website, that starts with how the PDF was created in the first place. And a lot of the best practices for creating a PDF, it's the same thing as for creating a web content, you know, well-structured um, headings actually using, um, using uh, structured, uh, the structured content options instead of just making something bold. These are the best practices to follow. Um, having a template for your, uh, for your PDFs is also great. And then finally, I don't like really promoting Adobe software, <laughs> but if you're using Acrobat Pro, um, there's actually an accessibility checker, and that's going to help you know what problems are in your PDFs before they get published. Oh, and export to PDF rather than printing to PDF. That's just a, a step that should be in your, your process because that's going to be the difference between something that is accessible and keeps the structured content you've created and something that doesn't. Okay, and I think finally, I think this is the last one, social media content. So you've created this great content and then you actually want people to go to that content. Um, and so you are starting to take it and translating it into some po social media posts. Uh, maybe you're putting it on LinkedIn. Um, maybe like me, you're like, I don't want to use Twitter X anymore, but <laughs> maybe it has to go there. I don't know. Um, in any case, there's some just general best practices. When you're writing hashtags, for example, you want to make sure that you're using a, a title case so that you have so that uh, a screen reader reading this out can actually parse out the different words. If you just make it all lowercase, uh, it's going to be impossible, and it's going to not not be parsed out as like reading the ability to read this word and then this word. User experiences two separate words. So these capitalized first letters, that's what you want to see in your hashtags. Um, just some basic things, reading your posts out loud, making sure they're simple and understandable, um, not having jargon, reducing acronyms. It can be really tempting to use jargon and ac acronyms when you don't have a lot of space to write your, your content. Um, use a reasonable number of emojis. <laughs> <laughs> and then often uh, you can write alt text, so take the time on LinkedIn to write the alt text. and if this content is being funneled in from content that's being published online, you know, try to set up the workflow so that you can just use the same alt text. It's quite a bit of work to think about an alt text, so if you can try to capture that and reuse it when you're publishing on social media, that's, that's going to be very helpful. Um, the problem with social media is that these platforms change all the time, so the tooling we have, or the options we have available for making the content accessible are also going to change. Um, and when you're creating social media content, you also want to think about how the videos get published. Uh, YouTube provides some auto captioning of your videos, but if you're posting them directly to social media, like uploading a video directly to LinkedIn, then 
uh, you're not going to be able to capture that goodness from the YouTube captioning. So you might want to create um, uh, a transcript or have some alternative content, which could be, you know, here's an article that also reflects the content of my, my video. Having something else that you link to as an alternative. So hopefully that gives you some ideas for how to create a better workflow around content that's going to lead to more accessible outcomes. I hope that you have some, some one of these points that you heard today you'll be able to take away and incorporate into your own projects. Um, and then just in general, I think a holistic approach to accessibility is going to lead to better results than having just one accessibility expert who's awesome. Um, because as Drupal people, we want to scale up our content. We often have tons of content to manage, um, and it is 100% too much work for one person. So hopefully these, these, these ideas will help you build that holistic approach. Um, I do have a guide if you're interested in more resources, an accessibility guide that I can give you a link to. Uh, which is no URL, but I can share these slides with you. And we are at Evolving Web running some accessibility trainings coming up uh, in December. Um, this is an online course, so if you're interested in that as well, please talk to me or my colleague, Dariza, who's here uh, down at our Evolving Web booth. Um, and that's it. You can ask questions or you can also email questions to me if you have anything uh, lingering that you want to know about. So thank you. Okay, I'm going to hit the red button again.